All right, so up, up next, uh, Gene Tunick and I are going to spend a few minutes telling you about uh, some of the work that we have ongoing uh, in the Institute for Experiential AI. I'll ask Gene to uh, time keep for me because um, if I go over, he has to go under. So <laughs> that seems uh, only fair. All right. Um, I want to start with an example that motivates why I am convinced that we can make such progress in the life sciences and in the health sciences by bringing artificial intelligence to bear on the problems we're faced with, but also why I think that that is a path towards improved artificial intelligence with respect to its performance on complex adaptive systems, which are the ones that we're all embedded in uh, and, and are a part of. We're looking at RNA sequencing data from 20 individuals with early stage multiple myeloma. And for those of you that are not familiar with this particular cancer, it was universally uh, fatal and effectively untreatable until some recent uh, immunological therapies. One of the things that would happen is initially these individuals would respond to treatment and then they would stop responding. The challenge has been that there are no consistent genomic markers associated with who is responding and who is not responding, or when an individual will stop responding to treatment. So they sequence the tumor, there are no differences between the individual when they're responding and they're not responding. If we look at these individuals as they progress through uh, their battle with multiple myeloma, This is what their gene expression profile looks like. Completely different gene expression profile between responsive and non-responsive cancer. No underlying genetic differences in terms of sequencing. So these are things like epigenetic modifications, changes in, in the way the chromosomes are folded, et cetera. One of the opportunities for artificial intelligence is that you can pick this out with the naked eye, which means that neural nets are going to be very good at identifying these kinds of patterns. The challenge, of course, is that we actually understand quite a bit about what's happening biologically in this transition between responsive and non-responsive. So most of our RNA profiles will look like the slide or the picture on the left. That is an organism that has multiple different cell types. Those cells contain different genomes from some of our endosymbiotes that have been with us for hundreds of millions and billions of years. This is what a complex eukaryotic cell looks like when it is regulating multiple different cellular processes. It has cellular differentiation, et cetera. On the right, this is actually what E. coli looks like for the most part. This is what a prokaryotic cell looks like that really only has to take care of itself, a relatively limited number of physiological processes, some environmental sensing. We know what's going on here is that you have a complete breakdown in cellular regulation. And the movement of the association between genes being expressed from their biological properties to things like just physical proximity on the chromosome. Now, why am I saying this? Well, what this means is that if we are going to treat complex diseases like multiple myeloma, we have to understand all of that evolutionary context that is coming with the individual. And that evolutionary context is going to structure the way that individual respond to therapy. It's also going to be impacted by the environmental context in which that individual grew up in. Whether we're talking about Roxbury or Back Bay will have almost as much impact as the evolutionary history that that person is carrying with them. And that means that we have to be able to readily interact with individuals in the context of their evolutionary history, in the context of their physiological and developmental history, and integrate that into the kinds of treatments that we are developing, into the kinds of care that we're giving. It's not a surprise that on Twitter this morning, one of David Baker, who just won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry student, was talking about that the actual secret sauce is a lot of really good project management and tight coupling of wet lab and dry lab. That's what we mean in the life sciences by experiential AI, so humans and wet labs in the loop. That is, of course, important for ensuring that AI maintains our values, but I actually think it's much deeper than that. I actually think that because of the responsiveness and the historical contingency associated with living systems, the only way we can study them is by constantly measuring and remeasuring as we perturb the system through treatment, as we look at different populations of individuals that are carrying along with them decades 
generations of historical contingency. That's what we mean by getting not to just N of one, but developing the kinds of AI tools that can actually learn and interact with these complex adaptive or living systems. And that's what we're focused on uh, in the Institute for Experiential AI, is partnering with startups, with pharmaceutical companies, with governments and nonprofits to bring these kinds of expert wet lab in the loop AI systems to bear on the world's largest and most pressing problems and then identify opportunities to roll back research into the university. So for example, one of the PhD students in my lab, Jessica Fernando, is studying how mice relearn tasks. Relearning tasks is a real challenge for neural networks. It is not a challenge at all for mice. This ability to sense in your environment, learn from context, and then adapt is critical for interacting with living systems. That's why our brains evolved to do that. And we can imbue those kinds of mathematical properties from the mice brain onto artificial intelligence systems, which will advance the kind of AI that we need to solve problems like multiple myeloma. Um, I want to end uh, just by thanking uh, the members of the team, I don't. I think some of you are here, so if you want to just stand up if you're on the AI and life sciences team. I'm gonna, no, there's, there, there are a lot of people whose pictures are on this slide, so I gotta find out where they are, but hopefully they're, hopefully they're in the lab working on something really important. Um, uh, with that, I want to uh, skip over and turn it to Gene uh, with just two kind of final parts. So AI and biology, why do I think the opportunities are so large? In particular, because of some of the things that neural networks are very good at. Neural nets are very good at taking data and figuring out nonlinear relationships that are otherwise hard to model. Nonlinear relationships that are otherwise hard to model is one very reductionist way of describing what's going on in this picture, which is that you have the genome, you have the proteome, you have the metabolome, you have environmental context, you have all the historical context that I talked about, and what we don't have are good maps between all of these various layers and how they interact together. If we bring the kind of multiomic, multimodal, environmentally uh, measured and context measured data sets to bear on the problem, neural networks can actually help us uncover a lot of what is going on. Even if they can't explain it to us with respect to equations, they can help us model the process. The second, and I think is much more practical, and this is one of the things I'm very excited to work on with folks in the room, most of our existing bioinformatics tools don't scale to modern uh, big data sets in biology, right? So we did a project with Juan, he who's a PhD student in my group, just trying to predict where a SARS-CoV-2 genome was sampled. Part of the reason we're interested in that is that we actually have a data labeling problem. This is another talk that I give about how most of our data are mislabeled uh, in, in all of the medical and biological sciences. So you've got a genome that says London. The neural net thinks it's from Paris. The neural net is actually not wrong about that. The data are wrong. This was a person who was infected in Paris, traveled to London, sampled the virus in London. It got labeled London, but that's a Paris virus, not a London virus. You could not do this with half a million genomes, probably even on the supercomputer at Northeastern, by aligning all these genomes to each other and using standard bioinformatics processes. This runs on her laptop with a neural network with nearly perfect accuracy. This is the kind of thing we need to do with AI in the life sciences, or identify the bottlenecks and solve them so that we can scale the problem uh, to meet the kinds of, of opportunities that we think are realistic. So with that, I want to thank you all again uh, for being here uh, with us today and turn it over to my colleague, Gene Tunick. Patricia, we have the same slide. I think I have another couple of slides in there from others, so I can skip over them. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much uh, for uh, not only coming here, but sticking around for the full day with us. I see the room is still packed. This is incredible. I'm going to take a slightly different spin on things. Uh, we've heard a lot about drug discovery and biology and biotech. Um, and I'm going to pose two maybe somewhat provocative points. Uh, I think Larry would agree with, with them as well. Um, and at AI plus health and human performance uh, within the Institute of Experiential AI, we see health as um, uh, something that is, first of all, it, it's important to know what person has the disease more so than what disease a person has. 
And uh, this phrase comes from the teachings of Hippocrates and has kind of perpetuated in the course of time. And I think that right now, I'm not diminishing the value of understanding the disease and the biology, but how individuals respond to treatments and diseases is, I would say, arguably even more important. Second, again, the importance of drugs can't be overstated, but if we were to have one hammer approach to address health and health span and wellness, it would be physical activity. Physical activity is the single most important predictor of all-cause mortality and morbidity. And if we remember Larry's slide from earlier in the day showing that today we die from cancer and we die from heart disease, by far compared to all other diseases, and physical activity is, uh, there's plenty of evidence showing that physical activity can mitigate both of those uh, as, as, as well as other forms of, uh, of uh, uh, death. So I would argue that investing uh, our resources and time in artificial intelligence approaches that um, uh, enable individuals to move are going to get the biggest bang for our buck in mitigating disease. So with that, um, I'm not, I'm not going to perseverate on some of these slides. Um, I think the other thing at play that's of interest here is the really big transformation that we're seeing in decentralized healthcare. We're moving away as a society from large brick and mortar facilities. Uh, of course, these are still being built. You saw uh, Rasu's slides earlier. You saw, uh, of course, the Mayo Clinic. The, the behemoth organizations are, are, of course, going to be uh, are not going away, but we're moving into uh, an ecosystem where health and health care is going to be delivered uh, in decentralized models at people's homes with uh, aging in place, in small clinics and rehab centers, and you're going to have the large health care organization systems operate very much like control towers to triage care to these locations where people live. And I think there's a lot of value to that. And, I think we'll hear from David and Colleen and others uh, later about how effective these types of models are, for example, in a hospital at home. So again, the success of all of this will rest on technology data AI, because we don't have the person power to deploy to all of these locations in all of the pockets of the world. And so with that, what do we need to enable all of that to happen? Well, we need to do the boring stuff. We need to. Uh, have the boring work of scheduling, of, of documentation, of billing, uh, all of that kind of stuff figured out. We need to have real-time-ish, as best we can, um, uh, curation of data with predictive models running in the background to help inform clinical decision. We need to have a means by which to characterize disease and guide interventions. So. Uh, radiology was a great example of that, digital pathology, another area we're pursuing. And we need to have smart assistive technologies that can be deployed to people, that can interact with people. And I think the key point here, uh, and again, riffing on earlier comments that were made, a key point here is going to be whether these technologies are going to be able to interface with humans the way a human would. So what is the emotional IQ of these technologies? And that will really dictate the uptake of this. And then finally, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't add AI literacies. We had a whole workshop on this yesterday. We need to invest in educating the future workforce, the clinical workforce especially, in being able to talk to our computer uh, scientists, data engineers, and so on, because Otherwise, the fields are going to go in parallel silo tracks. Um, I loved Larry's reference earlier uh, of a workforce that is specialized as data curators. Um, and this is, I think, a highly specialized future clinician that is versed in how to curate AI-ready data sets. Um, for movement, uh, in the context of movement, I would say physical therapists are probably best positioned. But I think that this is going to be, by and I'm biased, of course. So. 
Um, so with that, I'm going to dive very quickly through several projects, and I'm not going to cover everything. We have 100 faculty or so doing various aspects of health or life sciences at Northeastern, and I can't uh, go over everything. So I'm just going to highlight a few folks from the AI health team. We have folks working in human-centric computer vision, um, and I'll give an example of that. Natural language processing for health, especially mental health. Uh, fundamentals uh, of AI and machine learning for health, machine learning for in-home sensing, real-time prediction, image analysis, and of course, we have folks developing AI curriculum, uh, especially for our health sciences and clinical students right now. This is the team. Since Sam made his team stand, I'm gonna make you stand. There you go. Good. You also get the, uh, the pleasure of seeing me uh, pre-beard, so. Um, the mission is very punchy, better health uh, for all through human-centric AI, for anyone, anytime, anywhere. And uh, I don't know if I can play this or not. Uh, I love this video. This is uh, a project led by Michael Juan and uh, colleagues from engineering, Sarah Satavas and Bouvet, Emily Zimmerman. How do I play this thing? No. No. Okay. 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 If somebody can click play, great. This is a beautiful project showing how ambient sensing can be used to uh, detect, uh, in this case, respiratory rate. So this is uh, an algorithm that they developed, trained, uh, based on ground truth uh, from real respiratory rate data. But here, the, the algorithm is using computer vision to see very subtle motions on, of the infant's chest wall going up and down. You can see the corresponding respiratory beat um, up above in the previous slide. They're also using other pose estimation algorithms to look at positioning and early developmental pathologies uh, in infants. So wonderful work there. Uh, highlight a project that my team and I are doing with uh, one of our postdocs, Sophie Wang, uh, Matt Yorossi, also in engineering at Bouvet, looking at mapping motor topographies in the brain non-invasively. This is really uh, important work for guiding pre-surgical mapping for tumor resection, as well as for clinical rehabilitation of diseases like stroke. Um, uh, and there are some applications here to, to uh, neural prosthesis as well, BCI. Uh, this is work I'm highlighting here uh, using NLP in the mental health space by Annika Schoen, uh, Agatha La Prezida, and colleagues at University of Southampton. And so they're taking uh, large EMR data sets to look at uh, prediction of suicidality and rehabilitation, predictors of uh, rehab outcomes in uh, individuals with addiction disorders. And so um, um, one of the interesting things that emerged from their work, and by the way, this is work that they presented to the UK Parliament and is funded by, by the UK Parliament and the Office of Science and Technology through a new collaboration between Northeastern University of Southampton. But the, the real take home here, and, and the really interesting thing is, is that when you try to uh, use various algorithms, uh, NLP algorithms, to predict uh, a person's um, um, mood, and the moods are listed on, 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 on the bottom here, New, you know, no mood, <laughs> uh, anger, sadness, emotion. So the, the algorithms fail miserably compared to the ground truth, which is in blue, which is the human. And so they completely misclassify stuff. So it, it is a bit of a wake-up call. We've heard this the recurring theme that we have to take this with a grain of salt and be uh, really mindful of the biases in the algorithms and the hallucinations. Um, and these things are hard enough to predict by, by a human expert. Uh, and a wonderful project here using real-time uh, sensing, remote sensing by Zorkainen and uh, a faculty member in Bouvet, Jane Szynski. Th these are data that they're collecting continuously over the course uh, of the night, in this case, for uh, 500 days in a row using ambient sensing. In this case, it's a bed mat. They actually tried to use a, a wearable, and the, the individuals refused to wear it. They, they would forget it. They would throw in the garbage, whatever. So the most reliable source of data here turned out to be a bed mat where, you know, um, you have to lie on it. Um, but uh, they're collecting these data throughout the PACE network, which is a very large network across 30 states of elderly um, um, uh, communities. and. 
they're collecting data continuously, like I said, for over a year, and they're using it to model uh, the onset of delirium in acutely ill individuals. So again, really, and I don't have a, an output yet because they're still collecting the data, so I have nothing to share with you as a result, unfortunately, yet. Um, and then some of our work, if you could just press uh, play, this is the last slide, I promise. Uh, some of our work looking at assistive technologies, in this case, we're trying to train a robot to interact with a human, passing an object back and forth. And so here, the robot, interestingly, this robot is not trained on any kind of training data set or algorithm. It is using um, uh, uh, an inspiring data set that we collected, how humans interface with each other, and looking at little tiny sub-movements, micro-movements that they make. And so that trajectory planner that the robot is using is basically predicting a few samples in time ahead of where the human is going to transfer the object to and is trying to meet them there ahead of time as if you were interacting with another human. So again, we see this kind of stuff relevant for uh, assistive technologies in the homes, for example, helping individuals uh, get through their days. So with that, um, I wanted to highlight some of our uh, recent uh, partnerships on the industry side who we're very excited to work with. Some of these are with the University of Southampton, Annika's work, others are local. And with that, I, I want to thank you for your time.